Welcome to the Droma Preventative Health Podcast, hosted by the Jewish Orthodox Women's Medical Association. We provide you with up-to-date information on health topics geared towards the Orthodox Jewish community. This podcast content is provided for informational purposes only and is not intended as medical advice or as a substitute for the medical advice of a physician. Welcome to the Jewish Orthodox Women's Medical Association, or JOMA, podcast. I'm your host, Lisa Minkin. I'm a general pediatrician, and today I'm super honored and super excited to be interviewing Dr. Ilana Dumont, who is a neighbor of mine and a school psychologist. So I'm really excited to finally get a chance to interview her. Before I introduce Dr. Dumont, I will mention, as I've been doing lately, that if you have a topic you're interested, a person you want to hear, you yourself want to be interviewed or comments on these talks, please reach out to us at health, H-E-A-L-T-H, at joma.org. So Dr. Dumont is a psychologist who works with children and teens with anxiety and depression and other mental health conditions. In addition, she provides parent coaching to support parents in their developing strong relationships with their children. She is also trained to treat women struggling with pre- and postnatal challenges. She utilizes an integrated approach using evidence-based treatments that include CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, mindfulness, exposure treatment, and parent management training. She also believes in the validity of psychodynamic therapy and building a strong therapeutic alliance with her clients. She also works as a school psychologist at a private school in New York City. She understands the inner workings of school-related stress and can be particularly helpful in parenting strategies and developing coping skills for managing school-related anxiety and social dynamics. In addition to her clinical work, she serves on the medical advisory board at Lauren Bongiorno's Health Coaching for People with Diabetes. As a type 1 diabetic herself, she understands the unique challenges of living with chronic illness and value the commitment she has made in supporting those struggling with their mental health. Welcome, Dr. Dumont. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me, Dr. Rankin. I am so excited. Can I call you Alana? You, I mean, I think you've known me long enough that you should call me Alana. Yes. Are you, are you going to tell everyone? Yes, you may be. And then call me Elisa, please. Don't call me Dr. Rankin. Okay. Elisa, where, where my dad goes to his uh, Friday Night Minion. Right. Right. And <laughs> yeah, he's the big buffer there. <laughs> oh, yeah. All right. We could do a whole pod- podcast on just that, I think. <laughs> okay. So... Let's start with actually talking about our issues here. Um, We have so much to talk about. We could do this like for hours. Mm -hmm. Um, I love that you have multiple hats. Um, We could talk about a lot of the different things, but I want to talk about the intersection of school, what you do as a school psychologist and as a parenting coach, private therapist. Yes. Yes. Let's start with that. I can can just jump right into that one. yeah, and my third hat as a parent myself, right? I have I have two girls and I had a baby boy almost six months ago. So I'm I'm totally in it um, from that lens too, um, which I think has really just shaped even the way that I practice as a psychologist. I think that before I had my own kids, it was kind of like I know what I know. I've learned the theory. I've learned how to practice. I've learned you know kind of what to say, the protocols, and then you just add in your own experience. And it's like, whoa, I was way too judgmental of all of these parents and like how they're parenting, right? Like it's, it's just so hard. Um, and, and it's so rewarding and fulfilling, of course, at the same time. And, you know, my, my favorite thing to do are these two things. Like I can't even just choose one of like, do I want to just go full-time into private practice? I love working in a school. And I think that there is so much overlap Um, in these two things, because I'm on both ends of it. I I see it um, from the from the private clinician, where I'm working with parents, you know, privately, and then I'm in the school, on the faculty as the school psychologist. Um, And I I think that, you know, when when I think about the intersection, I, I literally think of it as that, right? Like, trust and open communication and honesty between the home and the school. And I think that we hear that, a lot. We hear that phrase a lot, like open communication. And like, what does that even mean? And if I had to tell a family what that means, it's, it's, it's really just tell us everything we need to know to best help your child. Right. Like I think that a lot of families and parents and and myself included, right. We're always thinking, are we doing this right? And are, am I doing the best thing to help my child? And then we worry that if the school maybe knows something about my child, is that going to influence either how they treat my child or how they think about my family? And it brings up all of these feelings and insecurities. But really, 
the best way we could help your child is if we know, is if we know whatever it is we need to know. Is there something going on at the home? Is there a learning challenge? Is there something that your own child is just dealing with internally? Like whatever we can do to help, we we want to help, right? We don't want to uncover it in, in a behavior that then we see as problematic and then have to call you in and uncover some, some big reason that this is happening. And so I could obviously go on and on about this, but that's, that's probably what I would say. Okay. I, I want to bring in your fourth hat, which you didn't mention. All right. Which is your own yeah. experience of chronic disease. Cause I think that all pulls together and making you such a powerful advocate. Um, you said my chronic disease is that what you said? Your, your, chronic, your own chronic yeah. disease. Yeah. Um, yeah, of course I, yeah, I'm a I'm a type one diabetic myself, and interestingly, was diagnosed as a young adult. Um, so, you know, one of the things I do, I I always try to think like, how can I integrate this into my practice? Also, um, I didn't want to work only with like patients with chronic illness. I have a couple of clients um, on my caseload that do actually have diabetes. Um, but what I what I've actually found to be the best way to kind of get in there is I serve on a board for a woman who started a, a type one diabetes coaching um, company where she works, you know, directly with type one diabetics. And so, the, the, you know, just on more of a holistic approach, not just seeing an endocrinologist, because there's a lot of nuances to mm-hmm. just being a type one diabetic, um, again, like as opposed to type two. And so um, something that I do a lot of in that in that space is working actually with the parents that subscribe to her coaching um, who have kids with with type one diabetes and you know building um, resiliency kind of around having this this challenge right and I think again if I happen to have this this particular challenge but everyone has a challenge right and so I think that it's helped me too to just sort of hone in on what are how are people approaching something hard in their life. And, and especially as parents, are we looking to, I guess, eliminate the hard for our kids or are we helping them work through and, and develop coping skills to, to approach whatever the hard is. And, and I think that, you know, my own parents would probably um, say the same thing that even though I, I was 23 when I was diagnosed, but it was like a whole long story that we don't have time for right now, but I was in the hospital bed. I was in the ER because I was in um, ketoacidosis and I had to go to the ER and I ended up being admitted for the weekend. My mom was laying, I've told this story so many times, she was laying with me in the ER bed and you know my mom. So, um, Mm -hmm. and then they opened the curtain and they're like, we only left this in pediatrics. And my mom just said, well, this is my baby. I'm not going Uh anywhere. And it was just this, you know, again, I was young. Now I have my own children. And I, I get this idea of like, you will do anything to, to be there with your kids and also to like take away any, and my dad, I even came in at one point and just said to me, I wish this were me. I wish I could take this away from you. And at the time too, I'm just kind of like, okay, like, I don't really like know how to respond, but then now I work with all these parents. I have my own kids to watch your child suffer or struggle is such a hard, grueling experience, I think, as a parent. And I always tell this to parents, you want a confident, resilient kid. That's the way to get there. They don't get there by you taking away hard experiences for them, taking away challenges from them, right? They don't get there by you making life easy for them. Um, that doesn't teach anyone how to cope and how to, how to, to do hard things. Um, so I don't know if that was answering what you yeah. were going no, no, for there. They're, they're really good points. And I'm going to point out that people can scroll back and look at the multiple podcasts I've done uh, on parenting and bringing up resilience. And by the way, a lot of it is coming from the parent themselves. Like you're talking about, you know, you have this vivid picture of your mom lying in bed with you and your dad saying, I just want to take it away. Um, and so we really have to work with the parents as well. Yes. And then I will say that, you know, my, my degree is in child psychology and I spent years working directly with kids. And I still do. I mean, first of all, in my role at the school, I'm working face to face with kids all day. Um, In my practice, I used to always see kids like there wasn't even um, a a time where I was like, I just want to work with adults or parents. And then slowly, slowly, I think that the the work has shifted, you know, the recommendations have shifted. And it's still, I think, early on in that where a lot of times I'll get phone calls or referrals, you know, I have a seven year old, daughter who she just can't get up and go to school. She has so much anxiety. Can you see her? And I I think some of this comes with experience. There's always that like element of imposter syndrome. Like, I don't know, do I have what what they want? Can I say this confidently to them? But I think at this point, I do 
most of the time say, I'd really rather work with you as the parent, right? Where yeah. it's, it really like, you don't real, you underestimate or we underestimate, I think how much we yeah. can impact our kids just through our relationship and our interactions with them and our support of them um, versus sending them to sit with a therapist for 45 minutes a week. And, and the carryover of that isn't always isn't always great, you know? And so I've definitely um, shifted my practice and and the way that I work in that I do really hand it over more to the parents or, or prefer wor- working more with the parents. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm, I believe in, in doing both, you know, whether family therapy or, you know, working with the parent and the child separately, you know, because if you just work with the child and that child is with the parent 24 seven and the therapist is with the child, you know, once or twice a week, exactly, it's just not enough. And, you know, we're not going to talk about so much about um, regulation here to the degree that I've already discussed it with multiple other wow. psychologists and other kinds of therapists. People can scroll back. Michelle Conti recently, I did um, the curious neuron, which actually this talk may end up being released out of order, but whatever. Um, who's a neuropsychologist who has a whole special program for emotional regulation. So yeah, I follow her on Instagram. She's, do. she's great. I do. I do. Uh, Cindy Hovington, she's amazing. Yeah. Um, so she she talks a lot about co-regulation. Actually, um, uh, the there's also the post-traumatic parent with Robin and Tipora Kozlowitz, who yes. I interviewed a very long time ago. She's also phenomenal. And she also talks about co-regulation, right? So if the parent is not able to regulate their own emotions or how they deal with their child's emotions, a therapy with a child alone is not going to go anywhere. 100%. I have nothing even to say back to that. Agree. <laughs> Agree. That's what I, I try to explain that all the time, that in the face of a tantrum, in the face of a meltdown of frustration, anger, whatever emotion your child is bringing to you, more important than any strategy we can give to them, a deep breathing, relaxation, like do go to your room and calm down, right? It's us showing them like we can handle you right now, yeah, right? When, when we go like this, then it's like this, like we're sending back the message to them. Like you're, you're right to freak out. Like we can't even handle what, what you're, what's going on with you right now. Like you're scaring me with how big your feelings are, you know? Right. And, and this is especially true with the pandemic because I am seeing a tsunami yeah. of anxiety in parents, also in kids that, you know, they're talking about the mental health crisis in children, but I am seeing a tsunami of anxious parents. Yeah. And so there's nothing wrong. In fact, maybe the, the best thing you can do for your child is to get your own help, even outside of getting the child help. Absolutely. It's so funny. You even say that before we, we were meeting now, I, I saw a client earlier this morning, a private client and teenage girl who I've known for years. And, and I said to her, do you know if your mom How's a therapist? Because mm-hmm. <laughs> she does. So I agree. And I said, that's why she's such a great mom, right? It's mm-hmm. it's knowing where what's yours and what's theirs and what you need to get support for yourself so that you can show up for them. Um, I think too that a lot of times when our kids are showing us any big feeling or some behavior that again, because you interviewed Curious Neuron and you know the other people that I would I'm going to assume you have a similar philosophy as me that when our kids act out or show us like an undesirable behavior, there's often something going on underneath there that's hurting or challenging for them. And they're showing us in this really unlikable way. And often that behavior will trigger something in us as the parent. And if we're not aware of what that is, where that's coming from, then we are going to interpret our kids' behaviors as bad, right? Or manipulative or whatever, jealous, whatever negative thing is is going to, you know, make us look at them like, terrible kid. But if we are aware, then we can show compassion and empathy and, and do that co-regulation dance with them. Right. And it's mom, put your oxygen mask on first. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and I really feel the need to constantly reiterate compassion for the parents today, because there's a reason yes. why parents are so anxious. Yeah. hundred percent. It's going on yeah. between COVID and a million other epidemics. I, I, I can't even, you know, I mean, uh, I, I can speak again, this isn't clinical. This is my personal experience. You know, I, yeah. again, I always think like our own feelings, like they start internally. I don't know if you've ever interviewed an OT before. I'm sure you have You've interviewed. Not yet, but I have a profession. Okay. I, I think they, you know, they are really the experts on like all these like internal sensory experiences that we have. But something I really subscribe to also is that when we have a, a an action or a behavior that comes out, it's starting from something that's within, right? And if we can learn to better focus and and acknowledge 
um, and get in touch with like these internal physiological feelings, we, we can better regulate our outside. But like, I know that for myself, that first day, if we're going back like two and a half years ago, that, that first day that we all got that call or, or watched, you know, the, the governor say like schools are closed tomorrow. I think we all had like, as, as like parents of young kids, this like sinking feeling in our stomach, you know, and this feeling of like, what, are what? Like, and, and it's this feeling of like something not safe is happening around us, right? There's a threat, something dangerous, something unknown. And today, today is my kids um, last day of day camp. And I said to myself this morning, even I said, why am I feeling so weird? Like, what's what's this feeling I'm having right now? And I and then I had to even remind myself, you're you're safe right now. Everything's fine. Your kids went to camp this summer. They're coming home today. There's this huge space between camp and school of three weeks that <laughs> all young parents are dreading. Um, but it is not the same, right? But your body reminds you. It reminds you of these like experiences of of that were negative, and you sort of need to like rewire it in a way. But just to your point, like. Yes, like as parents, we I think we've gone through so much of this need to protect our kids and make everything okay throughout these last two years. And then you can go in circles because it's like, okay, but let's be real. Let's make this the challenge. Let's let's know that our kids got through, we're getting through this. We're working through it. Right. And also like compassion and empathy, because that was unbelievable, right? For parents to be just stuck alone with their kids with no structure. And oh, that's gosh. what you trigger. It's the PTSD trigger. Right? I don't want to overuse the word PTSD or trauma, but there's been a wide spectrum of trauma that parents have gone through. Well, trauma is how you interpret it, right? So so for this, it, w- it could be trauma for a lot of parents, I think, you know, whether it... Right. There was big T, you know, the big T, little T trauma. There was yeah. definitely a lot of big T trauma, but there was also you know, death by a thousand paper cut, you know, multiple little things. Yes. I mean, we haven't even mentioned, say, the formula shortage. I mean, what did that do to parents? This parent. Oh. <laughs> so let's move on. Um, I, I want to talk about what you would say are some critical skills parents should have to help their kids as they go back to school. Hmm. Um, that's a good question. So, I mean, I, I think what, when I hear that question, I think the first thing um, that comes to my mind is, is is also first priority is knowing your kid and knowing kind of what your kid needs and what is your kid, how does your kid handle transitions in general? Because I think that shift between summer and school, it's a big one. And again, I think it's a big one for parents too, right? Like what are we experiencing and and keeping in mind whatever we're having right now there could be some parallel going on. Right. And at the same time, knowing what's ours and what's theirs. And am I struggling with like this, this space now between, between the summer and school and how am I prepping for like this schedule change? And then knowing what does my child need to be able to, to make this transition over to the school year? I think too, is knowing also it's obviously going to be slightly different depending on how old your child is. Um, But as a general kind of rule that I like to to always keep in mind for myself too is that when there is something difficult don't don't make it like the elephant in the room don't be afraid to bring it up don't think that if you ask your child if they're nervous for school it's going to make them nervous for school right like the feelings either there or it's not and oftentimes it is there and we avoid bringing it up because we're we're almost afraid to hear the answer I think as the parent because then we think like ugh now I need to deal with this um but my response to that too is that I, I really, and I t- tell us to parents all the time, I really want us to remove this burden of having to solve all of these feelings and problems for our kids, right? Most of the time, and I really mean this, like most of the time, they just want you to acknowledge that this is happening for them and that this feeling is there. Um, I, will, I, I always tell this story, like this is, it's not necessarily school related, but it just highlights this point that like, kids are really just looking to connect with their parents and connect on what's happening internally for them and have us help them make sense of it. So you've, you've seen my kids probably like on the block and whatever. And I, you know, my older daughter had a, this is years ago, but when my younger daughter was born, you know, there was like jealousy and rivalry. And I remember my younger daughter was like in a little swing and she was like six months old. And then my daughter was almost three at the time. And she runs into me, she's like, re scratched me. And my baby was probably just like doing this, you know, and I, and I, and, and 
in most moments, I would just say, oh, come on. She's a baby, you know, very like dismissive of whatever experience my daughter was having and try to just get in there and solve and tell her what's really happening rationally. But it was a better moment for me for whatever reason. And I looked her in the eye and I just said, okay, she scratched you. So like, how could I help you? Like, how could I, what, what do you need from me? Right. Or that must've hurt. She was like, what? And I, and then she, she just looked at me and she goes, um, can I like have a hug? And I said, Oh, that I can do like, get in here. Of course I can do that. Right. And there was literally no more mention of her sister after that. And so, so the point being that if you know, your child is amping up for school, this type of thing is hard for, I I would, I would say to him and her school starting going on for you what are you thinking right I would leave it open-ended you don't need to say to her are you freaking out about school right like how nervous are you you don't need to go that far but I wouldn't not mention it like that's the first thing I want to say and then taking it even a step further like if you you do know for a fact your child's nervous like let's talk about what that feels like you don't need to make your child not nervous you don't need to say things like oh, come on, you've been to this school before, like, it's just another grade, or like, it's, it's going to be, you know, you're going to be in the sixth grade now, like, you have all these responsibilities, and, it, you know, they know all those things, right? Something is hard for them, and to just be able to name that with them, and talk about what's hard for them, and just kind of let that sit for a little bit, instead of working and, and trying to convince your child out of this feeling. When we convince our kids out of feelings, it doesn't help them learn to trust their own feelings. So then, later on in life, again, like I said, when it starts on the inside, like, do you want your child to be in 20? I don't mean to make such an extreme example, but I often will do this with parents just to highlight the importance of this, that in 20 years from now, your child's at some social event as a, as a young adult. And, you know, for whatever reason, they just, something's not feeling good about this, about this event, right? Like maybe the people there or something happening. I don't know, but do we want them to just say, well, I don't know. Everyone always told me not to worry as a kid. So Mm -hmm. I guess I have no reason to worry now. Right. Because I I don't even know what worry means. Like, what does it even mean to worry? Like we want people to know that we have a feeling and it's okay to have that feeling. So if our kids are nervous for school, be nervous for school. I'm with you. I'm here. Right. I I think the trick for that though, is for the parent again, to be able to tolerate the discomfort of the child and back to your mom lying in the bed with you and your dad wanting to take it away from you. It's really hard. It's really hard yeah. to do that. And that's why you have to take care of yourself first. So you're able to be there and give that child that space. And I think that you said that so, so beautifully. I love everything that you said. By the way, I'm putting a plug in for my Sarah Hanna Radcliffe interviews. <laughs> the last one I did with her on anxiety, she talks also about this. Oh, um, really? Okay. Yeah. yeah. It's really, really important to give them the space and to do both things, not to minimize their feelings, but also you, you briefly touched on the other problem where is you, you overdo it from the empathy side. I've seen that too. I saw it once um, called interviewing for pain. Mm, it's such a perfect what title. What did that child say to you at school? Like when a child gets bullied at school, whatever, has bad interactions, go, what did he say? Oh, I'm going to call the mom. Oh, that's so terrible. It, it's a balance, right? You don't want to be overdoing it in the other direction either, where you're actually ramping up their feelings rather than just sitting with them. It's hard to do nothing. It's so hard to do nothing. I, I, I worked at a different school before the school I'm at now. And my, the woman who led the division of the, that I worked at would always say to parents, I like to enforce a 24 hour rule where your child comes home and tells you something and be with your child through that, but do not do anything for 24 hours. Like, don't do anything. Your child will come home and say, like, they didn't let me sit at this table today or so-and-so, like, took my pencil from my hands or, you know, told me she didn't like my skirt. And then you want to, I'm calling the teacher, I'm calling the parents, right? Like, but how about just looking at your kid and saying, oof, what what did you think when she said, what did you feel when she said that? Do you like your skirt? Did you like what you were wearing today? And and then by the next day, what did, so what did, um, what did Sarah say to you today? Nothing. She didn't say anything. Right. And you're also two things. And she's over it. Yeah. First of all, everybody wants validation. Think how you feel when you tell someone something and they gaslight you, right? You just Mm -hmm. want to be validated. You just want to have your your feelings acknowledged as normal, right? So kids want that too, number Mm -hmm. one. But number two, what did you just do with that particular story? You gave your child an ability to build the resilience muscles. Yes. In your own. Yeah. Yeah. And also what you just said, right? Like, before is you want, they want to feel their feelings are normal. I love that because 
I think that the the main thing too is like they're young and going through the range of feelings and emotions. So when something feels strong and unfamiliar, they just need someone to like help them know that this is a norm this is a normal feeling and you're not the only one who's ever felt that way. So even to build on that to tell them, "Ah, oh, you know, there was this one time I was in school and someone told me they didn't like my hair, the way I wore my hair. It felt bad. It really felt bad. And just connecting on your kid looking at you and thinking, oh, that happened to you too? Oh. And then it's like, okay, I can handle this. My mom handled this. I'm going to handle this, right? And just knowing that you're not alone. So so then also just because I, I, I know that like you want us to stay focused too. So going back, like, you know, there was this one time where, or not even this one time, I had to switch schools. It was really scary. I want to tell you about it. I had to, you know, my, my family moved and my, my dad got a new job and I had to, so this didn't happen to me. I'm saying like, make up a story to your kid and tell them about a time that you had a really big transition and how scary it was for you and show them that even my perfect parents had hard things, right? Right. You're showing them that you really get it. Yes. You're furthering the validation. But, but back to another elephant in the room. First of all, if you're having your own problems, you won't be able to do that. Yeah. True. Right. That yeah. help. But the other elephant in the room would be when your child is having problems yeah. and becoming too much for you. Yes. I have a daughter with disabilities, yes. including emotional. You know, I, I believe me, I'm like, you can't always do this. Yeah. No, right? no, no. Right. The difference between normal and abnormal result, you know, is intensity, frequency, and duration. If you have a very emotional intense child, for example, they may not even have a disability. As a parent, you get may get worn out. Yes. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. And I, I, this is, this work, the parenting work, I mean, is it's so depleting. It is so, so depleting. And like, it's like a, like a sort of pet peeve of mine, but also it's so important when we talk about this idea of like the self care, because like, what does that really mean? Right? Like, what does it actually mean for a parent? And like, I don't like that. It means like, oh, I took a shower uninterrupted, right? Like you deserve your uninterrupted shower no matter what. Right. But it's, I guess when I think about it, it's, it's being whole yourself so that you can be sturdy for your child. But, but, but that looks different. I think for everybody. Um, Right. Right. And I I want to pivot to, to kids with actual issues that need help. Um, that's where I'm moving towards because, yeah. you know, it's easier for the typical kids um, when to know to get help. I've talked about, you know, many times again, frequency, intensity, and, and duration, yeah. and they may be doing the same thing, but doing much more of it and having trouble functioning in, in the main domains of, you know, home, school, social, yeah. mm-hmm. right. Um, which is again, where you have intersection here, right. Yeah. And you, and you are, you are like a walking DSM with that language, right? Like that's exactly yeah. what it is. <laughs> Right. So let's, let's move on to the kids with problems. And I really want your input as a school psychologist, because I have to tell you as a pediatrician, I get so frustrated because the school is like a black box for me. I can't talk to anyone at school without the parent's permission, uh-huh. right? It, it is confidentiality, which is a double-edged sword. On the one hand, yes. you want confidentiality. Uh-huh. On the other hand, it's extremely hard to work together, putting aside the barriers of time. You know, pediatricians have I'm, I'm whining about this all the time on this podcast, inadequate time. Yeah. So I want to hear your perspective, ways that parents can be their child's best advocate and pull everybody together. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know if I'm going to be helpful. I share your frustrations. I have to tell you because like, I'm equally frustrated, I think, just because like on my, on my end in the schools, I should say, you know, in that role. I will have a parent in my office and then I'll say, and then they'll share with me that they do have an outside therapist or seeing a developmental pediatrician that's been working with them for years. And then the minute I say, can I get the number of that person? Can I speak? And then it's like, oh, they wish they didn't tell me. Right. And it's like, oh, no, 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 we don't, we're not comfortable with you talking to that person. And, and again, I think it goes back to full circle, like how we even started this conversation of, you know, we, we have to somehow build the trust between the home and the school, um, and really be able to put together all these parts of who this child is. And so your question about like, how can a parent advocate best for their kid? It is including all of these people in the conversations, like the best, the, not that I shouldn't say best, but the, the, I'm the most appreciative of the parents who like send me an email from day one of school and CC all these people who are working with this child team Moshe, right. And 
there's the OT is on there and the outside therapist is on there and the, you know, and it's like, these are the things I want you to know about my child. This is, this is what, how my child learns best. This is what happens when my child gets frustrated. Right. And I think that there's like some people on the school and that maybe might look at that and be like, whoa, like too much information. But like, if I'm looking at that, I'm like, thank you. This is gold. Right. And, and the same, it makes me think too, of like a neuropsych evaluation where like, again, this, and this can be like a whole other conversation. I think like a, an hour long podcast alone of like, what are the steps and the process of getting these evaluations done? And like, when you recommend even something like that, because I realize how tedious and expensive it could be, but it's when I get them, it is, it is a gift. It's a gift. It's explaining. I have so much to say here. Let me have a chance. (laughs) Go ahead. First of all, before I forget, Psychological evaluation is very expensive. It's often not covered by insurance. And you can often get enough from a school-based evaluation from the public school. Now, you are a school psychologist in a day school. They would not be the ones doing the evaluation. You would go to your school district, that that public school district that covers. They've changed the laws enough times. I don't know whether it's the district where you go to school or the district where you reside. But whatever the rule is, go to that district and get an evaluation. It will be more basic than the neuropsychologist, but it will be free. Free, right. And there's an op- option of getting a independent evaluation. If they have not appropriately addressed your child's needs in that evaluation, you can get the district to pay for an independent evaluation. It's not always easy to get, but before you go to a neuropsychologist, you can you know, talk to the school psychologist, talk to your pediatrician. I am a big fan of talking to your pediatrician. Um, so that was one point that I wanted to make because it's important not to push on parents something that they may not be able to afford. Absolutely. Okay, so that was one point. And I'm not against neuropsychological evaluations. It just matters. Some people can get a cover by insurance. Some people have a medical savings account. There's different ways to fund it. But for people who can afford it, we have to be careful. As a pediatrician, I never ask families in my practice to do out-of-pocket expenses they can't afford. Yeah. Full stop. I will find some way to help them. Yeah. And the other point is stigma. Yes. Okay. Talk about the elephant in the room. Why would a parent not want you to talk to someone regarding mental or developmental health? Um, it, it frustrates me to no end because if I have a child who has acute appendicitis, I can call the hospital and find out what's happening without having to sign consents and a million, you know, steps of HIPAA, you know, privacy protection. I mean, there's always privacy protection for any medical confidential information, but there's a whole other level, especially for busy clinicians, that makes a huge barrier to working together. You just described building your team, which is so incredibly important is what I promote very, very strongly, not to expect any one person, any one clinician to have the whole burden on their shoulders, not the school psychologist, not the private psychologist or psychiatrist or pediatrician. The parent certainly should not hold this all on their shoulder. You have to build a team, but the team has to be able to work together and the parent can be the person pulling it all together by being super transparent and helping everybody come together. And that may mean signing a bunch of consent forms and sharing that information. Yes, absolutely. That, that was but, one of the main reasons I wanted to do this talk, by the way. So we're at the heart of the matter here, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. So which, 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 which heart, which, which part of the heart, the stigma right. part or the school and, and the, and the, um, um, a mental and, and a medical clinicians and the family to work together. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, again, I think it's going back to that idea of the, I, again, this is what, this is my opinion. This is what I'm speculating. I don't really have the, the truth of the answer here. Right. But I, I'm wondering if it has to do with, well, I think there's so many elements involved and one being, did I do something wrong that my kid is, is different or struggling mm-hmm. Right. We, we don't have that for physical problems to the same degree. Exactly. It's, these aren't necessarily challenges you can always see, though we probably see them in certain behaviors and the ways that kids act and interact with others. But I think that when it comes to mental health or struggles, you know, internally with hard feelings and behaviors and acting out, it often becomes this reflection of us as parents. And, and in two ways where it brings up a lot of our own stuff. Like you kept coming back to like, what, what is this reflecting on me? What is this bringing up for me of my, of my own past and history? Also, did I do something wrong that my kid is like this? And then, and then lastly, you're, you're looking at your kid against, against a whole other class of, of students who mm-hmm. you have no clue if they're struggling with these things or not, but that's the point. Like we don't talk enough about these things. And so if everyone's going to be so private and full respect about privacy, but the less we talk about it, the less you're going to be able to identify with other people that might be going through the exact same thing. And I mean, how many times, you know, as, you know, 
again, just bringing it back to myself as a diabetic, I will never forget the first thing I did in my hospital bed was I Googled celebrities with type one diabetes, Mm -hmm. because you want to know that you're not alone. That's really what you're looking for. So like, why can't it be the same thing with this, right? Like going and and again, like I, I always, I give this workshop to parents of kids with diabetes. I give it about every four months around for this company. And And the number one thing I always say to them is you are doing the best thing just by being here and being part of this group and identifying with other parents who are going through the same struggle. So if you, you know, a lot of times when we'll recommend therapy or an evaluation or something to parents, I have to often say to them, nothing is wrong with you. Nothing is wrong with your kid, right? Like this is something that we actually deal with quite often. You would be surprised how many students in the school have therapists, right? Like it happens to, like you're saying, it's HIPAA. We don't talk about these things, but when we don't, it's an isolating feeling. Right. Right. But also going back to, you know, we have pressure now to parent. It used to not be a verb, by the way, right? We have pressure to parent perfectly and all these experts. And then it doesn't work when you have may not work for for a lot of reasons, but it certainly will not work for neuroatypical kids the way it works typical. So here you have a kid with ADHD or they're on the spectrum or they're just super emotionally intense and you're trying and you're banging your head against the wall. How do you feel? You often feel ashamed and it's it's your fault, but it isn't. It isn't. And also I think we need to redefine kind of what does it mean? What's, what does working mean? Like, what does that even mean? Does that mean less tantrums? Does that mean less acting out or no acting out? Does that mean no, like, you know, um, impulsive behaviors, right? Like this is, working, I think is, is part of the problem is that I think a lot in our, I think, especially in our generation, like we're, we're looking for this fix of like, I'm going to do this and then this will stop. Right. But where the, the training that I'm actually coming from, and I should, I should mention that there's a woman on Instagram too, right. Her name is Dr. Becky Kennedy. And I trained under her for, Oh, did I not share that with you initially? Um, Please connect me with her. I want to interview her. I can probably do that. Um, awesome. so, she, so I trained in her good inside approach mm-hmm. last mm-hmm. year, very intense, very intensively. And I actually came initially from a background of reward and consequences and behavior charts and timeouts and all those things, right? And like, that was what I was taught. That's what I was taught in graduate school. And that's what works. But when you, when you kind of, t- again, take that burden off and make the goal connection and helping your kid. And I know you don't want to go into like regulation because you've done it, but if you want to help your kid with regulation or frustration tolerance, you can do that through attachment and connecting right. and no, and no, you won't see the elimination of it right away. You won't. Right. Your it's, help- mm-hmm. it's a slower, but more effective, not being yeah. your head against the wall. People want quick fixes. Right. And there is a, a tremendous movement away from the old way, right, of behavior modification. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. And so learning about that as a parent, I think is really helpful. And the best way to do that is to go get help when you need it. The other problem, by the way, the other elephant in the room is there's no parity. And you can go to your doctor for diabetes or any other kind of care and your insurance will pay for it. And yeah. it doesn't make the same. Oh, that's a huge problem. That's yeah. a huge problem. I don't even, I can't speak to it even because right. it's, it's impossible. Right. I don't have so many answers to it other than try to pick it up early because the earlier you pick up a problem, the easier it is to treat. And there may also be resources. Like for example, there is um, parent training as part of early intervention. Mm. I'm not sure. I think it might be available in child for you know the CPSC preschool three to five level. Don't think it's available after that. There's just counseling. So the earlier, yeah, the earlier you reach out for resources that um, are free or ask your pediatrician for referral to something that's covered by your insurance, the, the better things will be. And, yeah. and that's why the stigma is, 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 a, is an unnecessary barrier. Absolutely. Shout it from the rooftops. And by the way, I like to say, I care about your mental health at least as much as I do about your physical health because your mental health affects your physical health. It's, right. it's actually behind so much of what doctors are seeing nowadays. There's no separate yeah. body on a stick with brain on a stick separate. It's all integrated together. Right. It's true. And it's funny. I always think about this to just be, again, like using my, my own diagnosis where two things, first of all, if I'm not going to see my endocrinologist every however many months, if I'm not like hooked up to my insulin pump and treating and managing this daily, like that's, that's, just, that's not going to work, right? Like I won't be alive. And so 
why not say the same thing for for any of these like hidden diagnoses, right? Like ha- that's one way that I think about that stigma is like you would treat any medical diagnosis. You wouldn't let it, well, maybe some people would, but you you would hopefully not just let it go, right? And why would we let that go for depression or ADHD or, or anxiety? And then the other thing I think too, is that because we were talking earlier about the the physical manifestation of of different diagnoses and you know, I always think too about the, the, the symptoms of anxiety, let's say, right. Like a heart racing or, or like a stomach dropping or limbs getting like shaky and jellyish. And a lot of those symptoms are very similar to a hypoglycemic episode. I think about sometimes both are a body system of awareness or like, like an alarm, like something's going on. So whether I need to treat that with like a glucose tablet or some deep breathing, right. It's the, it's both of our bodies, like telling us, to help, get help, do something. It's really well said. And by the way, as a pediatrician, I deal with all the time, kids coming in with physical complaints where there's an underlying mental health complaint. And I find it very hard because the parent wants everything ruled out and you could go on an endless diagnostic quest for they're having headaches or stomach aches or fainting or whatever it is. And it's much harder to sell the mental health piece because partly, you know, the kids will interpret, the parents will interpret, you're not taking me seriously. It's all in my head. But it all interacts. And that's how I try to frame it from the beginning. We're going to do both at the same time because everything right. interacts. I, I wish that, first of all, we had parity in, in, in mental health was, was reimbursed to the same degree yeah. or more yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. than physical health. Um, but we don't. And we have to deal with that reality. And maybe right. people who listen to this who want to advocates can fight for it on a you know, more political level. Yeah. Um, but but it's, so, it's so, so important. Um, we're not going to be able to do that to everything here, yeah. but I do want to have you walk us through what happens in the school setting when a child is struggling. When a child is struggling. Oh my gosh. It's such a, it's such a ge- school. it could be social. It could be academic. It could be both. Such a general uh, question. So I could take that in any direction. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I can walk you through what happens in my school. Um, I don't know exactly, you know, I don't know if this will necessarily be, um, the same protocol in every school, but, you know, I like to sort of come up with somewhat of, of a, I guess, you know, structured approach, though this stuff can be so layered and, and nuanced. Um, again, it sort of depends, like, is the first line coming from the school end or is it coming from the home end? But what I like to try to implement, so my, my favorite teachers are the ones who actually follow my protocol, is I will send a Google form, right, where it's just kind of like, if you, if you are noticing a student struggling, please fill out this form and we will come and then start taking the steps, right? And so that's, you know, basically the same idea as a teacher, like pulling my arm in the hallway and saying, like, could you come like check out this student, right? But I like to just like have it, um, you know, in my email or whatever. And what I like to do first is just like observe. That's like the first thing I like to do before I even like talk to the kid or call a parent or, you know, I like to kind of just see what's happening. And so I'll often just like go into the classroom or watch the child at recess or at lunch or at more of like an unstructured time. Um, And I will ask the teacher to like name me a couple of the behaviors that they're seeing that are, you know, outliers to them. Why are they even bringing up this student? And then again, I do... It's case specific, but I think it's important that the teacher has actually reached out to the parent first. I don't always like being the first um, phone call home about a behavior like this. Like I am this outside, my my office is on a different floor of this student. The student, the school is huge. The student doesn't even know who I am. Um, And so for the teacher to sort of lay the groundwork a little bit, like these are some of the things that we're seeing. We want to involve the school psychologist. I think it's a little less threatening than me just coming in right away and making that phone call. And it's then, to stigma, back to stigma. It, it, exactly. Exactly. And so, and, th- and then I will often, you know, call a parent, um, you know, get, ask some questions, get some background, see if this is surprising to them. Are they seeing these things at home, whatever it is. Right. Um, and then putting all of these pieces together, deciding what our next steps will be. I'm speaking obviously very generally. The, the other end is that sometimes a parent will call me and say, you know, these are some things I'm concerned about. Can you speak to my child? And sometimes that's what they're asking for too, is just, can, can you just pull my child out and speak to them a little bit? Um, you probably love that. Yeah. Those are my favorite. I was about to say yeah, that's, right. that's, a, that's a good one. <laughs> I want to point out one more thing before I forget, which is that because these are invisible disabilities, and I would say most of the internalizing anxiety and depression, as opposed to the behavior, I'm sure 
that you hear more about the kids who are hyperactive, impulsive, Absolutely. hitting with aggressive than you do about the kids who might be suffering from quite severe anxiety and depression. But I have to tell you, like sometimes they don't look that different on the outside. And that's why also speaking directly to this student is so important too, because a lot of times I'll have a teacher say to me, uh, let's just a second grader, let's say, always asking to go to the bathroom, never in the classroom, can't pay attention, can't stay in his seat. Sure. Like those sound like ADHD. Yes. Like if we look at this kid, maybe that is what it is. If I pull the kid out and ask them about school, and then I learn that school's really hard for them and they really just like can't read um, the Hebrew letters that are that are on the board. And it's just easier to go to the bathroom than to sit in this talk about sitting with the hard, right? Like sitting in the classroom and watching a teacher write something on the board that's literally another language that they are having trouble decoding. And then having that anxiety build up in their system inside, the feeling is too much to tolerate. It's easier to just get rid of it and go to the bathroom. Right. But my point is that not every child will do that. A lot of children will just internalize and they'll sit there quietly. Yes. And they'll the quiet, good kid in the back of the room who's not causing any problems. Yes. Who's not sure. going to raise the same level of red flags for the teacher, especially if they're bright, by the way, which is a whole other podcast. Yeah. Right? Underachieving children or twice exceptional children. I, I did listen to your one on the, the giftedness, though. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You interviewed somebody about it. Yeah, I want to do twice exceptional, but that's... Mm-hmm. That's another podcast. Yeah. Um, but the point is that a lot of children are missed. And it's really yeah. I'm speaking to the parents here to please look at your child, you know, when they come home and, and, and see how they're doing. And you may have to be your child's best advocate. Don't be afraid to reach back to the school and say, hey, what are you seeing at school? I'm seeing this at home. And some kids, by the way, come home from school and let it all out at home, but they didn't show at school. Yes. So the partnership is, is so critical. And a pediatrician wants to hear too. I mean, I do. I hope other pediatricians do. I know we're but busy, I, but I, mean. I have to tell you though, you know, you're, I don't know if you're the exception or not, but when I hear you say that you're as a pediatrician, you want to hear that. I mean, that's amazing. I don't know if that's often always the case or majority even of the time. Like I know that even I can only speak personally. I used to go to a pediatrician where it was like a factory, right? Like you got 10 minutes, there was zero focus on social emotional health. I happen to have a pediatrician that was fantastic and so thorough and comprehensive. And I wasn't used to it. And it took me like time. Like she looks me in the eye and says, what questions do you have? What are you worried about? Right. Like talk about like naming or feel like what are, what's worrying you when I didn't even mention being worried about anything. Right. But it's giving space for that to a parent. And I think the pediatrician, it's amazing to have that space. They, they I don't know to be more. They may not be as good as yours. Um, they may not delve into it as much as I try to. And by the way, I'm human. It, it's so exhausting to do it over and over again. It it should be spread among all pediatricians, not among a very few. Um, But I think more and more are getting more training for this. And because it's just so much of what we're seeing, I think we will get better over time. Um, But I think also as a parent advocate, you know, you you also have to pick a practice. If you pick a practice, which is a factory, well, then that's what you're going to get. Right. You're right. You can pick a pediatrician just like you pick other specialists. You're a hundred percent right. Right. But also, again, I'm going to advocate for the pediatricians here because it's not, it's not, it's not honest or fair otherwise. And that have realistic expectations. Build your team. Don't expect your pediatrician to do everything for you. Don't come no. there and have an hour long visit when you go through all your child's behavior problems along with their well visit. Make a separate visit. You know, pay that copay. You know, yeah, yeah. Pediatricians do not. We have a very low reimbursed field. We. This is the reason why we have short visits. So right. you have to work with us. Yeah. Educate us about your child, whatever, whether they have a physical problem or a mental health problem, please treat them both on the same level. Yes. And, and work with us Yeah. and with our limits, right? Just to be fair. Right. Right. Absolutely. Right. So I think that that's important. Um, so we're back to, you spoken to the parent. Mm-hmm. Okay. And, and what happens next? What so happens- again, I, Identified a problem, you talk to the parent. What do you ask the parent to do? Depends what depends how I'm seeing the problem. Do you want me to make one up or do you want to give okay, me an example? Like a problem that needs more than just in school counseling or just a little talk with the parent. I don't like in school counseling, let's be clear, right? I I meaning we will provide it, but I think mm-hmm. that sometimes parents think that, okay, that's that's enough, or that it doesn't substitute getting real um evidence-based treatment outside of school. Right. Not just that, but I want it to be crystal clear that in school counseling, whether it's in a public school, whether it's in a day school, is to help the child function in school environment. Exactly. And you really need to know the limits. A lot of parents say, my kid gets counseling. I don't have to go for counseling. They're getting right. it at school. 
No, they're getting it so they can function at school. Right. That's it. Right. Exactly. Especially like the IEP mandated counseling, like there are very clear limits with that, right? If there's, if there is something going on in the home, sure, it can come up in the 30 minute session that our counselor is, is seeing the student, but it's, again, it's about what's happening in the classroom. Like how, how are we supporting this child and sitting in his seat in the school, right? In the classroom or the anxiety behaviors that we're seeing in school. It's not really going to help a child process a divorce happening in their, in their family or. Exactly. Right. Right. So, so, right. So making, again, um, let's say we're determining that a child is exhibiting signs of depression, right? I, I would most likely want to have the parents in for a meeting for something like that. I don't like love doing these things always over the phone. Um, it's not always possible, but to kind of explain what we're seeing again, get that, get that home input too. like, are these things that you're seeing at home? And then for something like this, I would definitely explain, um, evidence-based practice and therapy for depression, um, and getting not, not, I don't mean like a neuropsych evaluation, but getting evaluated by an outside professional to determine. Right. right. Cause to underscore it, the therapy for that is not school therapy. It's not yeah. school, therapy, right. It might be CBT. It might be trauma focused therapy. There's many DBT, you know, there's many different therapies that are not going to be given in, in school setting. Exactly. Not in areas with rare, rare occasions of school partners with a mental health facility. And it's done at school with professionals, but that's a right. rare scenario. I wish right. it happened more often, but it's a rare scenario. Absolutely. I wish I had time in my day to be able to offer, offer full sessions to students, right? Like it's to, to get, to get to the even place in the therapy session where you can even start doing the work, especially with kids, right? Like it takes 15 minutes to warm up and get the relationship going. I mean, that's like, a really big part of it. Um, and again, just to just, I'm, I'm thinking of real life examples now and just obviously not violating any, anyone's privacy, but like an example of just kind of combining all the pieces that we're talking about. Like I'm thinking of a student at a previous school that I worked at where again, that behavior of like leaving the classroom all the time and having such issues transitioning between like, oh, they had their art class and then they have to come back and sit and do math. And like doing all these things were so hard for her. And she was crying all the time. She wouldn't talk. I eventually just had to get the parents in to say like, you know, this is just happening and happening and happening. And then we did learn there was a divorce going on at home and not to pry into anyone's private life, but that is a really crucial piece of information to understanding this student and talk about that, the parent child connection, but what about the teacher student connection? And it, it's knowing that information will increase a teacher's empathy and tolerance for this student's behavior, not excusing it, but at least being able to connect with the student. Like today's a really hard day for you. I can see that. Right. Versus, ah, oh, there she goes again, leaving the room again. Like can't listen, can't follow the rules. Right. Like it's, it's a completely different approach when we, when we have communication. And then also again, to, to, I have a lot of feelings about like mandating therapy for someone. Right. And, and I, I don't, typically feel comfortable ever doing that unless it's for safety concerns. Like there's been times where I've had to mandate, take, pick up your child right now and take them to an emergency evaluation type of thing. Um, but if we're thinking more about something like this, it would, it would really just it, to explain the importance of why your child does need outside support right now. Like these are the things we're seeing in the school and it's obviously a response to what's happening at home. And this is what she will need. Right. So what happens when you're not getting it to work? What happens if you're facing resistance from the parent? I don't know. Can you help me with that? Because it's a really big problem. <laughs> it's, 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 what do you it's, do and what are the consequences? So it's, it's hard, it's but it's a really hard. hard question to answer, I think, right? Because, you know, there's, I've worked in different school settings. I think that you know, part of it is the system and, and what is, what's the philosophy of the school as a whole? Um, because yes, you know, there's been situations where there's a lot of resistance. And again, I, I want to, I, I don't want to forget to mention there's cultural implications here also, right? Like it's not, it's that stigma piece is mm -hmm. different depending on your background and like r religiously and culturally where you're coming from. And so, you know, sometimes that's a very big barrier. Um, as well. And I, I've, I've been met with that before. And it, I, I, I'm not necessarily saying this is the way to go, but there's, you know, been moments where students have been, you know, families have been told we, we really can't help your child anymore in, in our school. Your child's not learning. I almost think it's like, I'm thinking of it almost as like a natural consequence where it's like, 
we're not going to continue to move your child through the grades here because for whatever reason, whether it's a learning disability or, or a mental health issue, there isn't learning happening. Your child's not gaining any age appropriate. Right, right. I mean, and, and I think there's two different, two different things that can happen. You can have a family. I'll give you a typical scenario, not a patient of mine, but just, a, you know, a composite of a child who has ADHD and the parents are divorced and the mother wants the child on, on evaluated, possibly a medication and the father's against it. And there's a lot of fighting going on. Yeah. And the child is not medicated and not doing well in school. And in this particular made up scenario, a composite, right? Um, the child needs it. Not every child who has ADHD needs medication, but in this particular scenario, the child is not learning, running around, hyperactive, distractive, not completing the work and not learning. That's, that's one scenario. Yeah. And, and yeah. I, that, that's an example. I, I just want to conclude. That's an example of a child who could be in this setting yes. if they had the right support, which might be a need. very popular example, by the way. Yeah. It's a real thing. It's, it's ADHD, very real. And there's a tremendous amount of resistance to medication, which is a separate I did a whole bunch of podcasts on ADHD, including non-medication approaches, but the bottom line is function. Let's not forget how you and I initially connected, not from being neighbors, but professionally was because you were extremely helpful to me with a very challenging case I was dealing with, right? And it had to do with this. And again, I'm not I'm not divulging anything because this is such a this is such a common problem where I I am I'm not a medical, I'm a psychologist. I'm so I could never say to a family, he needs to be on medication, but I can say to but I can say to a family, he needs a psychiatric evaluation. You you have to go take that next step of at He's least- no longer in an appropriate placement the way things are, which doesn't yeah. mean it can be fixed, right? There right. are children, by the way, who are in a setting where they can't be. You know, there's yeah. a tremendous um, um, movement to include kids in the least restrictive environment, which means that, you know, for a from kid in their community or local, you know, day school or a school where other kids from the community go to, but it's not always appropriate, even with maximal support. Yeah. So yeah. uh, I don't want to go down the road of medication versus not medication. I did multiple podcasts on ADHD. Yeah. Um, well, I think the point is whether medication or not, whatever the support that's being recommended, if there's resistance, I don't think like you're, and this is sometimes what I'll say, you're not allowing us to even see what this child can do with, right. with the right support outside. So maybe that's therapy, maybe it's medication, maybe it's um, a tutor, like whatever it is. Right. But let us, Give, let's give it a chance so that we can even see if there's if there's a difference. Right. And another common scenario, not to point out particular you know cases, is the parent, like you said before, people want a quick fix. Yeah. So while they're not doing medication, they'll say, oh, but I have, I have, you know, a, a homeopath. And I did an interview with a homeopath. I'm not, you know, <laughs> making fun of homeopaths. Um, I think there's a role for everybody here to bring to the table, but Mm -hmm. let's say the person's going there because they want the magic cure. In fact, the homeopath I interviewed, by the way, says sometimes she tells them you need medication for ADHD, just so you know. Beautiful. She's in Israel where they work together. It's, you know, not like- Well, then everyone should know their strengths and what they can contribute and then where their road sort of ends with that patient, right? Right. But, you know, there are so many other, you know, roads that parents can traverse looking for the quick fix. And meanwhile, the child is struggling. And I think that that even takes us back to something we were saying earlier is that the quick fix is sometimes this idea of reward and punishment, right? Where, because yeah, you will get the behavior you want if you, if you implement that. Right. Um, And, and also because, you know, you, you mentioned about your own daughter and I'm, I'm wondering, and I, this is not my area, but you know, this idea of ABA therapy, right. And I, and I'm pretty sure that that's mainly about, about behavior and uh, rewarding behaviors and reinforcing behaviors, right? And so- Working against it also, that's a separate topic. In the neuro, you know, neurodiversity movement is, there's a certain strain against ABA, but that, that's a whole separate topic because ABA is a method. It doesn't necessarily imply pure behavior modification. Right, okay, fine. So help a child get skilled. But, the, but my point is, right, is that like it's, it is removing a real piece where you're, you're, you're lacking this, connection and relationship where yes, you're seeing challenging behaviors, but let's get, let's get underneath it. And if you're the root of it, right. Yeah. Right. Rather than just look at the superficial. And like I said, like we're moving away from more of a strict behavior mod approach right. to, to more of uh, an understanding and, and uh, you know, co-regulation, regulation, emotional skills, all of these kind of things are very, very different. It's more getting to the root of the problem rather than just the superficial behavior that we see. Right. But I, and uh, yes. And I think also because something you had wanted, I don't know if we're going to get to it, but um, you, you had written out the, the pressure of the academics or placing too much importance on academics. Right. right? 
Right. And, and this makes me kind of, you know, seg into that for a minute, just because I think that teachers too are looking for a quick fix where again, and, and there's, there's no judgment there I, on my end, because I know that I, I'm not the one leading a classroom of 25 kids, right? Like it's, it is challenging and hard and you want to just be able to have everyone in line. Sometimes though, I'm, I'm recommending to teachers, like take those five to 10 minutes at the beginning of every class and do a non-academic related activity, get everyone grounded, um, do something to connect with your students because if you think about it, you're going to end up spending the same amount of time, maybe more, you know, giving kids consequences or having to talk to kids on the side because they're acting out. And that's pretty time consuming. If we want to maybe be more efficient, consolidate and put this time at the beginning of the class where you can connect with students, put everyone in a place where their brains are open and feeling comfortable and safe and ready to learn, you might see differences in that way. Um, it's like kind of putting it on the front end instead and being more like preventative and proactive, right. I guess. Right. That would be amazing. Right. I know. The work of Ross Green in this area is tremendous. You know, the explosive yes. child, he's done yeah. lost in school. He has a whole program. It's amazing. People should look up Ross Green, G-R-E-E-N-E, mm-hmm. who I hope to interview someday. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good goal. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I spoke with him. But anyway, um, so we're going to have to end. Um, I can't do everything. We have so much. I told you we were going to have more. We can't really talk about inclusion. Um, to a greater degree, that's really a whole separate topic. However, I did interview um, Esty Schiffmiller, um, who's an autism mommy and who's working really hard on social inclusion. And by the way- I heard that one. Cannot be um, in a mainstream school. It doesn't mean that they can't be included in your community. And I think it's important to think of it that way because it's so painful. And I'll never forget when my daughter had to leave, you know, uh, the local um, community school, Hank, you know, our local community school, she was in the preschool in my own community and she had to go to public school and it broke my heart. Yeah. Right. Um, so I, I think we're moving more. We have a lot of programs to help kids who are not able to be in the mainstream, be included socially. And, you know, the more we can bring in appropriate supportive programs to do real inclusion, but real inclusion is not plopping the kid in the mainstream program where they can't get enough support. It's, it's yes. as simple as that. No, it's not doing, it's doing a complete disservice, I think. Right. To the and, student. And, right. And, and, and to wrap it up, I would say that to, to make that partnership with the openness to discuss and trying to put the, you know, the fear and the stigma and the shame aside or get help with that is the best way to help your child. Absolutely. I mean, I agree. Yeah. You're all in for this. So we're yeah. going to have to meet for part two because we didn't finish. <laughs> I would love that. <laughs> Thank you so much for doing this with me. I really for having me. I I mean I I love it. I love doing this. <laughs> yeah, this, is, this is a lot of fun, and we just got to continue. Yes, thank you so much. Thanks for listening to the Joma Preventative Health Podcast. If you've enjoyed this, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts and share this with your friends. For more information, check out our Instagram at Joma underscore org. Check out our website, www.joma.org, that's J-O-W-M-A, dot org, or email us at health at joma.org.